Hello, chemistry students. I am Mrs. Gosmish, and behind the camera is Mr. Kane, and we are your chemistry teachers for this year. And what we are going to go through today is some of the safety procedures that you will be working on when you do labs. And the most important one is going to be wearing goggles for every lab you do. And next to me here is our goggle cabinet. It is in our rooms in the science hallway and it is right next to the storeroom which students cannot go through but every goggle cabinet is right next to the storeroom really hard to miss and I'm going to open it up and you will notice that the goggles are beautifully arranged in very neat rows we'd like to see it that way before the lab and after the lab in order to be disinfected appropriately, they have to be in these rows and not just thrown in helter-skelter. You will get a pair of goggles, usually for your lab table, your group. They are splash goggles. They have the nice sides here so that chemicals cannot splash under just plain old like safety glasses. So these are called splash goggles. And the strap is adjustable. You put it on. You adjust the strap, and you are ready to do a lab. Hi, I'm Mr. King. Um, you can see that we're sitting, standing here right next to the chemical storage room still. Uh, what I want to show you is a couple of things. Uh, number one thing I want to show you is the fire extinguisher. You can see that it hangs right on the wall, and uh, it's not attached to the wall in any way. It's just uh, you just pick it up and pull it. It's pretty heavy. It's probably about 15 pounds. Uh, if a fire does wind up starting in the lab, uh, the best thing to do is first make sure that people know that there's a fire. Uh, and then second, one person should walk to get the fire extinguisher. Typically that'll be a teacher, but if the teacher's not available, it might wind up being a student. Uh, in order to use a fire extinguisher, it's not very difficult. All you have to do is remember a simple acronym, PASS, P-A-S-S. -S. Uh, the P stands for pull, so you would pull this pin that's sitting right here. A would stand for aim. You aim the hose at the base of the fire. S is for squeeze. The handle here needs to get squeezed as you're aiming. And then S is for sweep. You sweep the spray back and forth. And that will help you to put out a fire. Pass. The second item here is a fire blanket. If a fire starts on a person, we don't use the fire extinguisher because it uses carbon dioxide, which uh, people don't breathe very well. So we use a fire blanket on a person. Uh, it's a pretty simple device. It's just a nice wool blanket. Uh, if somebody starts on fire, you want to, as a lab partner, do uh, what they taught you in kindergarten. Stop, drop, and roll. The person who's on fire usually doesn't remember stop, drop, and roll, so you have to remind them. And perhaps sometimes even help them. Uh, if it comes down to it and you need the fire blanket, uh, you just grab the fire blanket out of here and you do not fan the flames. You just place it over the body part that is burning and leave it there. And then the final piece of safety equipment that we need to talk about that's on this side of the room is the first aid kit. We usually keep it on top of the goggle cabinet or on top of the fire blanket. should be right over here. Pretty simple. We keep uh, typical things like band-aids and... Uh, antiseptics and gauze and things like that in here. We do have uh, more than one first aid kit typically in our rooms. There is another first aid kit located over by the chemical shower. Uh, speaking of the chemical shower, uh, if you wind up getting a caustic chemical on you, you may wind up having to use this. We haven't had to use them uh, in many years. Uh, actually, I've never had to use the chemical shower before. but. Uh, Typically, when you need to use the shower, you've got chemicals on your body, and you need to get them off because uh, they get trapped in between your clothes and your skin, and they start burning your skin. So what winds up happening is we've got a pole chain that usually rests up there, uh, and using the chemical shower is pretty simple. I'm not going to actually pull the lever right now, but uh, as you're showering with the chemical shower, you do need to pull off the clothing that's on because the water winds up trapping the chemical underneath your clothes. So if somebody winds up needing to use this, the teacher is going to be getting people to help, uh, get, getting other people out of the, the room, and uh, you're going to be under here trying to get your clothing off to keep from getting burned. Uh, the way to use the chemical shower is very simple. You pull down. And 
and it automatically goes back up. Also where the shower is located, you have the eye wash. You should not have to use the eye wash at all because your instructor will walk through the room when you're doing the lab and basically kick you out of the lab if you do not have your goggles on when they said you had to have it on. But just in case there's an incident where something gets into your eye, you have to come over to the eye wash station and you push it back and you get awfully wet. So you can adjust it, but you got to get your face in there and your eyes in there to wash out your eyes. Okay, if you are a contact lens wearer, you have to open your eyes really super wide so that the water actually washes them out of your eye. Because you can always buy another pair of contact lenses. You cannot buy another pair of eyeballs. So when you, if you have to use the eye wash, really open wide so those contact lenses get out of your eyes. Otherwise, they're going to melt onto them. The other thing that is over here is for liquid spills, and it's a three-step process. Step number one, you're going to use the sand to make a dam around the spill so you can contain the spill in a certain area. Step number two, if it's an acid, you use the acid neutralizer. If it's not an acid, you do not have to do this step. Step number three is an absorbent so that it can absorb or suck up the liquid. And then finally, dust pan and brew. So you sweep it all up and that takes care of the spill. Okay. There are some optional lab pieces. You can see that uh, Mrs. Gossish and I were both wearing our lab coats. Uh, you will not have lab coats just because of space, but you do have these lovely, lovely lab aprons. Uh, they're available back here anytime you want to use one. You can pick one up and use it. Uh, other things that are available, uh, if broken glass, if glass does break, which it does break. Uh, number one, let your instructor know about it. Number two, never pick up gro broken glass with your hands. Always use a broom and a pan. And anytime you have broken glass, always put it in this container here, uh, which is for broken glassware. Never throw trash into a broken glassware container, please. If gloves are available, they will be put out. Uh, please do keep in mind, if somebody has a latex allergy, we won't be using gloves. The other side of the lab also has these lovely lab aprons on it also. This is the fume hood. There is one in every science room. And as you can see, you can see into the next room, there's their fume hood. When it's in use, the chemicals are inside the fume hood. The door is shut. And all that poisonous gas is being sucked up and out into the atmosphere. In cases of emergencies, which in the over 10 years I've been at Lockport, we've never actually had one in the science classroom. But in case of an emergency, there are a couple of options. Option number one, if there is a fire by the door, the front door, the classroom door, Go to the windows, open them up, pop the screen, and get out of the classroom that way. Option number two, the storage room here where typically students are not allowed to go into can be used as a passageway to the next classroom and out that door just in case there's a fire in front of you and maybe behind you. The third option and the one that's used most logically is the exit from the classroom into the hallway. Notice above me, there are two signs. The red sign is for a fire exit and tells you to go to the east exit. We're going to show you that in a second. The white one is for tornado. Tornado drills occur. We move down the hallway, two doors, to a room with no windows. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to show you where the fire alarm is and the fire exit. So if the alarm bell goes off or there's a fire in this classroom, you leave this room, one of the three options. We're going to go through the door. Hello, the horticulture room, please. The horticulture room is up here. Just walk now. Okay, we're going to go this is the fire alarm at this entrance. Pull the fire alarm down and leave through this door. 
this is going to be your fire exit any time a fire drill goes off, whether the fire is in the classroom or whether the fire is in the workshop down at the other end. This is where you're going to go out. You're going to go out, you're going to take a right, and you're going to go across towards the soccer fields. Another option for alarming the rest of the school to a fire in your science class is to come out of the classroom, head towards K Hallway. There are actually two more fire alarms you can pull within a very short distance. Here's the first one before the intersection. And here's the second one right after the intersection of K and C hallways. Once you've pulled the alarm, head out the exit there. This is only if you have an emergency situation where you can't get out the horticulture way or you're panicked or anything like that. You have three fire alarms within a very short distance of your science class in the C hallway.